Thing was perfect on my ear until I put my glasses on. Now it's all messed up. Feels like it's gonna fall off. All right. Well, welcome, like I said before. Thanks for coming in this morning. It's awesome to have you here. It's awesome to be here. A little added stress. Some of you may know, some of you may not, but they video this thing now, so. <laughs> That's, uh, for such a little church, we have actually quite a nice little website. If you guys ever want to go see or look at, look up an old sermon that somebody's done, whether it's Rick, Dan, myself, John, um, it's available out there in audio on our website, so you can go and do that, which is kind of cool. Now they're taping it as well, the video side of it, so you can watch me stumble up here over and over again. Alan, can you keep up with me over here? Sorry. I don't move around a lot. Oh, I haven't. If you're wondering if I've turned it on, I just did. Can you hear me now? Sorry about that. Whew, a lot of stuff to think about. So this morning, we're going to go and finish up um, Jesus' high priestly prayer in, uh, in John chapter 17. We're going to read that in just a little bit, but to give you a little bit of a backdrop, this is at the tail end of the Upper Room Discourse. So Jesus has spent his last evening of teaching his disciples. He's intimately teaching them. Because in just a few short hours, he's going to be arrested and taken away and crucified for our sins. And so he's, he's implanting in them and encouraging them and reminding them that when he's gone, a helper is going to come. right? And he's doing all this stuff together here so that they'll be effective in his mission when he's out of their lives and the Holy Spirit is, is in his place. So that's what's going on here. We've already talked through the first portion of chapter 17, the last time I filled in. If you want to go see that, you can dig it up on the website. Um, it's in the audio form, not the video form, but that's okay. And so we went through that last time. Uh, this time we're going to pick it up and go uh, John 17, 13 through the end, but it'll uh, through 26. But we'll, uh, we'll read the whole thing for effect on this prayer. So... Brett, if you've got that up, we can uh, all stand, please. We're going to read this responsively, so I'll read the odd. You guys read the even. It's a lengthy little portion. Take us a few minutes, but we'll get through this together. I'm certain of that. There it is. Jesus spoke these words lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they are obeyed your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are.
But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. Awesome. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, as we read through this prayer, this intimate prayer from the Son to the Father. We just pray, Lord, that you'd help us to apply it to our lives today. Help us to see your hand guiding us through all this. Lord, as the prayer says, protect us from the evil one. Give us your joy. Show us your truth. Lord, breathe through us your spirit so that we can be lights in this dark world. Lord, help us to shine here in Cleelum and to the farthest reaches of this world. And we just pray, Lord, that your, uh, your hand would bless us here today. I just pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. So go ahead and be seated. So like I said, this week we return to Jesus' prayer in chapter 17 of John's Gospel. It's known as the High Priestly Prayer. It's the longest recorded prayer in the Bible. Yet, as we just read it, start to finish, it took less than four minutes. I think this is an interesting takeaway for application in public prayers. Brief prayers, well thought out, could be more effective than long rambling prayers. But that's not to say that prayer isn't important and crucial in our daily walk with Christ. Jesus lived a life full of prayer, from start to finish in his ministry. When he began, he retreated to a solitary place and fasted and prayed. He often retreated to be by himself to pray, and oftentimes prayed through the night. He was almost in constant prayer to the Father, and Jesus was in perfect unity with the Father. So if Jesus, the Son, who was in perfect alignment with God the Father, prayed so often, how much more should we, a fallen people who are often in disunity, pray? In this particular instance, Jesus prayed aloud. Most of the time he prayed, I believe, silently or, or to the Father. We don't have to pray aloud. But he does it here, and he said it, it was for the benefit of, of those around him, his disciples, to be able to hear so that they could remember his prayer when the Holy Spirit came and they were writing about the, this account in the Gospels. 
All right. In this second section of the prayer, we've already gone through uh, almost, well, we've gone through from verse 1 to verse 12 the last time. And this section, section of the prayer starts in verse 6 and goes to 19. Um, so we started to unfold it last time that I taught. But we saw then that Jesus is praying for the disciples that God had given him. We saw that Jesus' main request of his Father was for those disciples. And really by extension, also for us. And his prayer for them is that God would keep the disciples faithful to reflect clearly his character so they would be able to know the same unity Jesus and his Father share. Jesus' prayer implies that this kind of unity in the church is possible only when the believers are living godly lives in alignment with God's will. This week, we'll move on to three more requests from Jesus, or petitions, if you will, for the disciples. And then in the conclusion of this model prayer, Jesus extends his request beyond the disciples to all future believers, including us. As we get into verse 13, there are two outwardly stated, stated requests and one implied desire for them. And we're going to talk about that for just a little while here. This implied desire for his disciples is in verse 13. Jesus prays to his Father, But now I am going to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. It's clear that Jesus' desire is that his disciples might express his joy. We've seen this before in this discourse, in chapter 15, when Jesus is teaching on the believer's union, with Christ using the metaphor of the vine and the branches. You may recall from the vine and the branches teaching that Jesus wants his disciples to bear much fruit. In other words, create many converts. And this fruit can only be produced as they abide in him. The vine who nourishes the branches. At the conclusion of that teaching, Jesus said in chapter 15, verse 11, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Abiding in Jesus, which implies doing what he says, brings great joy. And it's the very joy of Jesus. In chapter 17, Jesus prays to his father what in chapter 15 he told his disciples. Jesus wants his disciples to observe his teaching for joy. And not just any joy, his joy. We, most, we must frequently remind ourselves this truth because it dispels a common and very destructive lie of the devil. And that is, obeying Christ is very hard and sacrificial, and therefore, if you obey him, it will make you miserable. <laughs> and that's a lie. Right? The devil wants us to think that, but that is an absolute lie. Obeying Christ will not bring misery or despair or, or the oppression that comes from doing things that are purely out of duty. No. Obeying Christ brings joy. And Jesus wants his disciples to have joy, and the way they get that is to do what he says, to abide, to abide in him. If we in the church would only believe this, we would spare ourselves so much pain. We tend to resist God's will at times because it cuts against the grain of our lazy, self-indulgent flesh. Why should I fight to resist that temptation when caving into it will bring pleasure? We ask ourselves that. Or we ask ourselves, why should I forgive that man who has hurt me so desperately? I want to hate him. I don't want to share my faith. People will think I'm some kind of religious nut. Men can think, I don't want to sacri sacrificially love my wife. Marriage shouldn't be that much work. <laughs> Women can think, I don't want to submit to my husband. I know better than he does what is good for me and this family. And God says, resist temptation for joy. Love your enemy for joy. 
Share your faith for joy. Sacrificially love your wife for joy. Submit to your husband for joy. The joy of Jesus expressed through us. This prayer should encourage us to trust God for joy and obedience even when it's difficult. Another myth this prayer about joy debunks is that teaching doctrine divides the church. According to Jesus, this doesn't happen. His teaching or doctrine brings joy. Many believers don't see the point in learning doctrine. It seems unnecessary. It rubs us and it puts a little sandpaper in us, right? Oftentimes people believe it it causes fights to break out and churches to split. The problem in church division is never the doctrine, unless it's destructive false doctrine. Doctrine doesn't divide. Sinful responses to doctrine divides. People think, I don't want to believe in an eternal hell, because if I do, that means my atheist mother is there. Dan just spoke about hell and the realness of hell last week. I don't want to believe Jesus is the only way to eternal life. I have friends that believe differently. I don't want to be taught things like propitiation and penal substitution. I shouldn't have to think that hard about God. And Jesus says here, his teaching or doctrine brings joy. The fullness of joy that he experiences. Jesus desires that his disciples express his joy. A second request Jesus makes here in these verses is found in verse 14 through 16 when he prays, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Christ's request here indicates that Jesus desires that his disciples will be protected by God in this hostile world. Jesus speaks of the world nine different times in these verses that we're looking at today. And the world, as this is speaking of in the New Testament, speaks of it not as a physical, material world. The world that he's talking about is the fallen, dark, and spiritually hostile kingdom temporarily allowed to have control over this planet. It's governed by Satan who rules over the world through his demonic powers and principalities. The world hates God and anything that bears or reflects his light. And Jesus says in John 3.19, and this is the judgment, the light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. God invaded this world with the radiant light of his son. And this darkness in this world hates it. He says in verse 14 of his disciples, I have given them your word and the world has hated them. One reason that the world hated the original disciples and it still hates the church today is because Jesus has given his word to the church and the opening of his word brings light into that darkness. The probing light of the gospel exposes sinners for what they are, lost, deceived, and loving the darkness. The gospel pronounces that they're condemned apart from the saving faith in Christ. They fight against those truths, and their response is hatred for those that bear the light of the gospel. Jesus says in verse 14 of the disciples, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. And then he repeats it verbatim in verse 16. Do you think that might be important? Jesus reflects back on what he has said earlier in verse 6, that the disciples were given to him out of this world by his father. They were transferred out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light with Jesus, who is the light. The disciples are now aligned with Jesus in that kingdom. They were, as all believers are called to be, aliens. 
strangers, sojourners, pilgrims who no longer belong to the kingdom of this world but remain in the world for the purpose of bringing the light of the gospel to the world. Like the song lyrics go, and there's a couple of them, this world is not my home, right? Cademan's Call sings about that. That's a newer version. Jim Reeves sang about it in the past. This world is not my own. I'm just a passing through. The followers of Christ are in the world, but they are not of the world. We're called to be the light in this dark world, to actively war against the forces of darkness, not to compromise with the world by becoming like it, or disengaging from it in isolation. It's no accident that John's Gospel calls Jesus the light of the world. And Jesus, in Matthew 5, refers to his disciples as the light of the world. Because the darkness hates the word-bearing light of this world, and Satan is the rule of this world, and he is much stronger than us when we're on our own, Jesus, in verse 15, calls on the Father, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Jesus does not want to remove us from the world. We have a job to do. Neither does he seek to shield us from all the oppression. Our willingness to suffer for him reveals how valuable and treasured he is to us. But he does pray for protection from the evil one. And this is consistent with how he taught the disciples to pray in Matthew 6, 13, where it says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The word there, evil, is translated the evil one. Though Satan is defeated and has been stripped of his most potent weapon against us, our unforgiven sins, and though we've been given spiritual armor with which to do battle with his forces, we must still be wary of him. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5.8, Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. The, advers the adversary the devil is formidable. He is not to be taken lightly. We are to be sober-minded, serious. It's a real war. And he can, through his deception, take unwary believers captive and greatly darken their testimonies. The good news is we can be confident of God's protection because Jesus prays for that, not only for the disciples, but for us as well. Jesus desires that we be joyful and protected in a hostile world. He makes a final petition to the Father in verse 17, where he says, Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. What does Jesus mean when he says, Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. To sanctify means to make us holy, to be set apart, primarily in a moral or ethical sense, so that our lives increasingly resemble that of Jesus. A third point here in this prayer is Jesus desires that his disciples live holy lives. When Jesus asked the Father to sanctify the disciples, he is asking the Father to make them holy. The process of God making a believer holy is called sanctification. It's a big word. And I just want to take a moment here to distinguish between sanctification and justification. When a believer through faith accepts Christ, God, in a once-for-all-time experience, declares us legally righteous. We're justified. We are pardoned of our sin and made acceptable to God because we're united with Christ, and that's justification. There is nothing a believer can do to become more justified or more acceptable to God after they are justified. Nothing. Sanctification is different. As we are sanctified or made holy, we are gradually transformed as we become increasingly righteous in the ways we live, becoming more and more like Jesus. All right, And in this life, 
we're all on a path towards becoming more and more like Jesus once we've become justified. It's kind of like when we first stay in a dim room, we can't see the flaws. I've been in a lot of houses, and if the lights are down dim, I can't see the torn wallpaper or blemishes and things like that. But if I turn my little dimmer switch up a little bit, it brightens the light and I can expose more flaws. All right? So that's what it's kind of like. And Paul, the apostle, described himself as the least of the apostles in some of his earlier writings. And then later in his ministry, he calls himself the chief of sinners. Did he sin more as he went on through life? No, I don't think so. He became more aware of his sins. And it's oftentimes those, what we would call minor sins, but they're sins all the same, right? So the sins of covetousness, covetousness or lust and things like that, we might not even give them a thought when we're living in a horribly sinful life, right? But then as we read the word and become closer and closer to what Jesus wants us to be, we realize, man, I'm really kind of coveting the neighbor's car. I have to really watch that. I have to, I have to do something about that. Or I really wish I had something. Or wow, that caught my eye. Right? Those are what we're talking about. And oftentimes, uh, through the life of a believer, if they're becoming sanctified, they start to focus on and make remedies to avoid falling into those sins. That's what sanctifi sanctification is all about. Sometimes, it's through interactions with one another. We become sandpaper, not to chafe and to drive them off, but potentially... When a believer talks to one another about truth, we can expose sins in our lives and we can start to polish on others, ourselves, to uncover those sins so that we can put those sins away. All right, so that's all part of a community as well in rubbing together, interacting with one another so that we can sanctify each other. And why does Jesus request that his father sanctify his disciples in the truth? which he declares with this statement, your word is truth. How does the truth of God's word sanctify us? There's two ways. First, the word of God is a revelation of God in Christ. And that's what the Bible does. It reveals God in Christ. The Bible reveals God to us more clearly than anything else and causes us to see his glory. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3.18, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The first way the word of God sanctifies us is that it displays Christ's glory to us. And as we behold him, we are transformed more into his likeness, becoming more like Jesus. We become increasingly holy, increasingly different from the world because Christ is different from the world. A second way the word sanctifies us is a bit more involved. When Jesus said, your word is truth, he is mainly talking about the gospel. The gospel sanctifies us or makes us like Jesus. And this is what Paul says in Romans 1, 16 and 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of, the, of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for, it, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The gospel is the power of God to save us and part of that saving work is sanctifying the believer to live differently than the world, to live a holy life. As we've seen, those who follow Christ are not of this world, but are aliens who have been embedded within a different culture with opposing values and different priorities. Those sanctifying changes in our hearts are increasingly reflected in the decisions we make about things like what movies we watch, what music we listen to, how we treat other believers, how we treat the world and those who hate us. The power of the gospel working in us 
causes us to increasingly obey God, and Paul says this obedience happens through faith in the gospel. The righteous shall live by faith. In Romans chapter 1 and in chapter 16, Paul calls this the obedience of faith. How does faith in the gospel cause us to live more obedient, holy lives? It's a good question. The answer lies in what we'll call the two looks of faith. All right, here's what I mean. First, as we are tempted to sin in some way, we draw on the gospel's power to make us holy by looking back 2,000 years at the cross and reaffirming our faith in what God did for us. My flesh tempts me to sin in some way, but I fight that by looking back 2,000 years when Jesus died for me. He loves me that much. He suffered an excruciating death for me, taking the punishment that I deserved for my sin. Because he did that in the past, he is no longer my judge, but a friend whose father adopted me as his son. I'm brothers with Christ. As a believer in those gospel truths, it helps motivate me to fight against the temptation and by God's grace overcome it because I don't want to abuse the one who I know by faith has done so much for me. So there's the first look of faith, a look back at the cross that stokes our faith in his great love for us and ignites a grateful and obedient, inducing love for him. All right, I want to be obedient to the one who did that much for me. A second look of faith, and this one is far more frequent in the Bible, is a forward-looking faith to what some have called future grace. This is a look ahead to our future. And an example of this, uh, this particular appeal to future grace is in Hebrews 11.24, where it says, By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the, sons of, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. He's looking future, not past. The reason Moses gave up his privileged life with Pharaoh and instead chose to suffer with God's people is because by faith he considered the benefits of living with Pharaoh to be fleeting pleasures compared to his future reward in God. He trusted in the promised future grace of God and in the next life he would have much better pleasures than what he had in that moment. That faith in future grace is what compelled him to make this huge sacrifice in his life. Paul reveals this same two looks of faith dynamic in Romans 8.23, where he said, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Do you see the relationship between the cross and the future promises? If God in the past was willing to send his own son, raining down his wrath upon him, crushing him to redeem us from our sin, then we can surely trust him for the promised future rewards of our obedience. Those future promises should be incentives for our present obedience, because in the past, God has invincibly and supremely proved his trustworthiness by sending his son to the cross. These two looks of faith can be seen in smaller details all through the Old Testament, where the, the Jewish people looked back at how God had protected them in the past and that gave them faith in what he would do for them in the future. Right? And sadly, they were given all those promises and they wandered off and still obeyed or fell to idols. Those two looks of faith can still remain relevant to us today, even on a smaller scale, right here in Cleelum. You know, it was 
it was three years ago, almost to the day, that we were notified by the Seventh-day Adventist Church that we would no longer be able to utilize their facility on Sunday worship. We had no idea where we were going to be able to go. And so we became nomads for a while, went up to the school, started looking for property. God provided all this through amazing circumstances, none that we could have thought of all in one brainstorming session. We couldn't have done that. We couldn't have brought the right people together without God doing it. We couldn't have had the finances to do it, lest he opened up people's wallets and provided beyond expectation. And here we are, sitting in our nice facility, worshiping the Lord. He's got plans for us in the future, right? So we can look back at what he has done for us in these last three years, and we can be confident that if he is pushing us to do something in the future and we're unified with his will, he will provide everything it takes for us to get there. And that's the God that we serve. And it's amazing. And we can use those two looks of faith in our own personal lives, but certainly in a big picture, we can always look back to what Jesus did for us on the cross, he suffered and died for our particular sins, every one of us, and he's promised that in the future we'll be with him in glory. So put that to use today. In John 17, Jesus teaches we are sanctified by the truth in God's word. We know the truth sanctifies because it reveals the glory of Christ and we become like what we behold. Second, the truth sanctifies us because the word reveals God's great redeeming love for us in the gospel. And that love serves a ground for us to believe the promises of future grace that serve as incentive for us to live as holy people. Saying no to the fleeting pleasures of this world <clears throat> makes it easy for us to do that if we look at future promises. In this prayer, we see that God desires his followers to live holy lives. He wants us holy for a purpose. Verse 17 is where all the previous verses converge or come together, and Jesus prays, As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. This is very similar to the statement Jesus makes to the disciples three chapters later. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. That's in John 20, 21. There's a reason why that statement follows these requests. Jesus has prayed that the disciples would be Christ-like so there could be perfect unity in the church. He has expressed his desire and plan that the disciples would share and express his joy. He has prayed that the church would be protected and that the church would be holy, not living like the world, but in the world. And here he tells us where all these prayers are headed. Jesus wants his church to have profound unity, to express his joy, to be protected from the evil one, and be holy. And why is that? So they can accomplish his mission for them. A church that is fighting and is divided is a terrible witness to the world. A church that is joyless is a poor reflection of Christ and the good news of the gospel. A church that's not holy has lost its light, its distinctiveness from the world, and therefore loses its impact on an unholy world. We must see that. In this prayer, the main reason Jesus prays these requests for his disciples is related to their mission. And that's the same as his mission. These prayers are ultimately directed to help them make disciples of all nations. If we miss this, we misunderstand this prayer. When Jesus prays for his disciples, he prays that they would be different than a divided, joyless, unholy world. That we offer something, or more specifically, someone who is radically different from them to reach them. As Jesus concludes his prayer, he transitions from praying for the original apostles to those who will believe in me through their word. And that's us. In other words, he pray, he's praying for all believers everywhere, from the death of the apostles, the last apostles, to the church today. This part of the prayer shares many of the same elements as his prayer for the apostles had earlier. 
Part of this is because as with the disciples, he is praying for God to equip us for our mission of making disciples. Like the first apostles, we too are called to preach the gospel to all nations, including the individuals in our little town here. If we were to give one another, uh, if we were to give one overarching summary of this section of prayer, it would be something like, for God's church to be faithful, several key elements of his grace are required. Jesus is praying that the Father would grant his church the necessary expressions of his grace in order to be faithful to his mission. So far this morning, we've focused on three of these elements of grace. Jesus prays that they might have his joy. Write that down. I think it's in one of those open spots, right? He prays that the Father would protect his disciples in this hostile world, and the disciples might live holy lives. They must live holy lives to be effective as they are made holy by the truth of God's word. Earlier still, in our last session, Jesus prayed that the disciples might be one, that they would be unified. All of those expressions or elements of God's grace are not for the disciples' personal joy or for personal fulfillment, but so they could accomplish their mission. This is ultimately a very mission-focused prayer. Through this prayer, Jesus tells us both the nature of this unity and for emphasis, he, re he reiterates the purpose of this unity. The nature of this unity he asks from the Father for us is found first in verse 21. <clears throat> that they may be one. Just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us. In the second half of the, first, uh, of the very next verse, Jesus also prays that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. So Jesus prays that this unity within the church would be perfect, and complete. No holes, no weak spots, invincible unity. Jesus had earlier prayed for unity in verse 11, but he is much more graphic when he uses this language, that they may be in us just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. This broadens our understanding of this unity, and it really makes it twofold. Here Jesus prays for the unity that is a cosmic unity, right? It's a unity infinitely more than we get along with just moving along with each other or having the same general direction. This unity is different in that nature. And Jesus prays that the church of Christ would be united with each other as the Father and Son are united. Also, that they would be in the Father and the Son. So Jesus is praying that you and I are united with the same uni unity that he has with the Father. That is incredible unity. That is lockstep unity that keeps us all in fashion with one another. And he's praying that we as a group would all have that same unity with Jesus and God the Father. Now that is a cosmic unity. And if we're in that unity, there is nothing that could stop us because we're in perfect unity to the Christ. Our prayers would be in perfect unity to the Father, just as Jesus' prayers were in perfect unity to the Father. Think about the power of a body. And it's not just for our little church here, it's God's church, right? So it's our unity of our little church with other local community churches and beyond that to the missions field and to every believer. That's an amazing unity that we could share. And that's what he's praying for here, so that we can be on his mission. How does that happen, right? It happens by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, which he's talked about already earlier in the, in the uh, discourse, he's talked about it many times, that when he's leaving, the helper, the Holy Spirit is gonna come. And that's the Holy Spirit that makes us one in Christ. And because that's true, we must also be united with the Father 
because Jesus says that the Father is in the Son. The Holy Spirit is in the Father as well. We're in the Holy Spirit together, and we have perfect unity with Christ if we're, um, if we're truly, truly um, in his word. Now, we need all those elements that we just talked about, those, those, uh, those different tools to have that unity. The fact that Jesus intends the church to have the same kind of unity among ourselves that the Father and the Son have with each other is itself utterly mind-blowing. The Father and the Son, except for those few brief hours when Jesus was on the cross, have known perfect unity with each other for all eternity past. And yet he prays for this kind of unity as we relate to each other. But this is more than that. Jesus says in verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. Jesus is saying that kind of unity within the church is made possible by the fact that the church is united with the Father and the Son. We have been united with each other because we are united with the Father and the Son. The reason the church can be caught up in this kind of unity with the Father and the Son is first because we are created in God's image. So there's already a profound connection between us and God. But even more than that, through Christ's work on the cross, we have been made sons of God through Christ. Paul says in Galatians 4, 4 through 7, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir to God. Though clearly not divine ourselves, we have been brought into this divine family. Our relatives include God the Father and our adoptive father and the Son. Jesus is our brother. If we have trusted Christ, we've been made part of that family. I have no doubt that when we're in glory, we'll appreciate this far more than we do right now. Most believers probably don't even think about it nearly enough that this cosmic unity with the Trinity is ours through the gospel. It's glorious, and it's awesome if we can get our arms around it. But it's also humbling because apart from grace, we have no more business in that divine company than a bulldog in a beauty pageant. This cosmic identity of the church is one that should stir us to worship as we see how far God has brought us. From God-hating, God-blaspheming rebels to someone who through the church and by the Spirit has been ushered into the fellowship of the eternal trinity. This union with God through the Spirit enables us to be in a, profoundly, a profound unity with each other. This unity we have does have other implications. Being one with God means that we must also share God's mission. We touched on that already. If God is on mission and we are one with him, then we are on mission. We see the reason Jesus prays for this unity twice. In the second half of verse 21, Jesus prays, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Likewise, in the second half of verse 23, he prays, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Again, it's for our mission that Jesus asked the Father for this unity in the church. That they may believe you sent me. That the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. There are some realities the world must know. That the Father sent the Son to redeem lost people. And that the Father loves his blood-bought adopted children in the church as he does his one and only begotten Son. We share in that same love. The question is, how does this kind of unity communicate to the world that one, Jesus was sent into the world by the Father, 
and two, that we are loved by the Father as he loves Jesus. First, when the world sees this group of people called the church who are very different culturally, look at all of us, socioeconomically, different careers, different mindsets, varying degrees of gifts. When they see that intense, diverse group of people who would never to be together apart from Christ, there we, we would be seamlessly working together with a unity that the world does not see anywhere else. When the world sees that, if for no other reason than curiosity, they'll ask the church, what in the world is going on? We know that because even in our day we see this. That incident where the Amish people so promptly and powerfully expressed their forgiveness for that man who had murdered their children. And the world was at their doorstep asking how and why they could do that. When the world sees the church live this kind of unity and the church testifies, it's because God the Father sent his son, Jesus, through whose death and resurrection he created one new unified race of people out of many. The evidence this unity provides for that argument will help make that case that the Father sent the Son. Second, the world will see that we are loved by God as he loves his son because only those people who are loved this dearly by God can love each other so completely. When a church of sinners that understands what it is to be loved by the father as he loves his sinless son, they will increasingly love each other and they will testify to the world the truth of 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. The world will see this amazing love from God in the church as we love each other. As someone who sinned put Jesus on the cross, in a billion years I could never deserve that love. And he gives it to me. So how can I possibly refuse to love someone he tells me to love? No matter how difficult or what they might have done to me. If he loves me as he loves his sinless son, how could I not love the other brothers and sisters he has adopted into my family? His infinite love for me overflows from my heart and pours out to my brothers and sisters. Those who believe the gospel, who are coming to understand how much God loves them, increasingly love one another. The first truth of this text is being faithful to our mission requires radical unity born out of God's love. A second truth is being faithful to our mission requires every element of grace that Jesus prays for his church, working together with each other. Those elements of, of grace we talked about just a moment ago. The point here is that Jesus is not simply praying for random elements of grace, but those which the church will need to accomplish the mission. As Jesus prays for the church, he prayed for joy, unity, truth, holiness, protection from the evil one, and that they may manifest or show the love that comes from being loved as the Father loves the Son. But in verse 22, he gives a very different element, and that is glory. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may become perfectly one. When Jesus speaks of glory here, he's probably referring to what John says in 1.14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. God sent his glory to earth in various ways before he sent it in its fullness of his son. His glory appeared to Moses in the tabernacle, which points to Jesus as he dwelt or tabernacled among us. He sent his glory to the temple, which Jesus fulfills as the new temple. But if Jesus is ascended to the Father, how will that glory be present in the church? The answer is, like we said before, the Holy Spirit, which Jesus in this discourse has repeatedly spoken of as his replacement. 
It's the spirit that joins the church to Jesus. It's the spirit that gives the power to accomplish the mission in so many ways as we have seen earlier. The spirit is the glory behind all of those six special elements. The relationship between these elements of grace and the gospel is that all the elements of grace must work together. Kind of like a wagon wheel, if you would. Christ at the center, each of these elements as spokes to that wheel so that it becomes a functioning part, a functioning tool. They're all part of the same. Christ is at the center, but they are interdependent on each other. You cannot have holiness without truth and love. You cannot have unity without love and truth and holiness. You cannot speak truth effectively without love and joy. Joy is always rooted in the truth. The reason Jesus prays for all these elements is so that the church can accomplish its mission by making disciples. That means if you want to have holiness and unity and protection and joy and love as a witness for the world, you had better be serious about the Great Commission, bringing others to Christ. Because that's why Jesus is praying for these things. We can't fulfill the Great Commission without these elements. And we shouldn't have these elements or even pray for them if we're not about the Great Commission. Show me a church where the members are genuinely concerned with obeying the Great Commission, and I will show you a holy church. Show me a church where the membership is intensely concerned with the Great Commission, and I will show you a unified church a protected church, a truth-driven church. These elements Jesus prays for are not like Lego blocks that you can add just one at a time. They're more like ingredients to a cake. They're all combined together in a mixture. If you don't have all the ingredients, you don't make a cake, or at least not a very good cake. The most powerful witness of the church is not found in any of the things which are of this world. We are not of this world. That's central to this prayer. So that we can, by God's grace, live in a unity that is fueled by personal godliness that we can exhibit. Christ-like joy and a moral purity or holiness that points to Christ and a kingdom very differently from the morally bankrupt kingdom of this world. Though there, those are the expressions of power of the gospel that Jesus uses to bring dead people to life. When we pray for these things, like unity and joy and holiness, do we pray for those so that we can be more powerful witnesses to this world into which we have been sent? We should be. Jesus is so mission-focused here. These qualities are not fundamentally for us by ourselves. They are for a watching world that, even though it hates us, desperately needs to see Christ's reflection on earth through his church. We can see the priority he places on the mission here because a few hours after this prayer, he suffered and died for his church. So we could, by his grace, be united, joyful, holy, a city set on a hill, a light that cannot be hidden, that supernaturally shines in this dark world, this dark community, and throughout the dark world. We must never forget how mission-driven Jesus is for his church. Are we serious about obeying the Great Commission? May God give us the grace to live as a united, joyous, and holy people for the glory of God and for the sake of those who desperately need to see the light of Christ in this dark world. And may we get serious about the Great Commission here and to the nations so that by God's grace, we will honor Christ by seeing his prayer in John 17 answered right here in Cleellum's Calvary Chapel. Let's pray.